The Copernican Revolution The first pitched battle between theology and science, and in some ways the most notable, was the astronomical dispute as to whether the Earth or the Sun was the center of what we now call the solar system. The orthodox theory was the Ptolemaic, according to which the Earth is at rest in the center of the universe, while the sun, moon, planets, and system of fixed stars revolve round it, each in its own sphere. According to the new theory, the Copernican, the Earth, so far from being addressed, has a two-fold motion. It rotates on its axis once a day, and it revolves round the sun once a year. The theory which we call Copernican, although it appeared with all the force of novelty in the 16th century, had in fact been invented by the Greeks, whose competence in astronomy was very great. Copernicus, who was born in 1473 and died in 1543, has the honor, perhaps scarcely deserved, of giving his name to the Copernican system. After studying at the University of Krakow, he went to Italy as a young man, and by the year 1500 he had become a mathematics professor in Rome. Three years later, however, he returned to Poland, where he was employed in reforming the currency and combating the Teutonic Knights. His spare time, during the 23 years from 1507 to 1530, was spent in composing his great work, On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Bodies, which was published in 1543, just before his death. As it was, he long delayed publication because he feared ecclesiastical censure. Himself an ecclesiastic, he dedicated his book to the Pope, and his publisher added a preface, which may perhaps have been not sanctioned by Copernicus, saying that the theory of the Earth's motion was put forward solely as a hypothesis and was not asserted as positive truth. For a long time these tactics sufficed, and it was only Galileo's bolder defiance that brought retrospective official condemnation upon Copernicus. Now, there is nothing in the Copernican astronomy to prove that we are less important than we naturally suppose ourselves to be, but the dethronement of our planet from its central position suggests to the imagination a similar dethronement of its inhabitants. While it was thought that the sun and moon, the planets and the fixed stars, revolved once a day about the earth, it was easy to suppose that they existed for our benefit, and that we were of special interest to the Creator. But when Copernicus and his successors persuaded the world that it is we who rotate, while the stars take no notice of the earth, when it appeared further that our earth is small compared to several of the planets, and that they are small compared to the sun. When calculations and the telescope revealed the vastness of the solar system, of our galaxy, and finally of the universe of innumerable galaxies, it became increasingly difficult to believe that such a remote and parochial retreat could have the importance to be expected of the home of human beings if humans had the cosmic significance assigned to them in traditional theology. Mere considerations of scale suggested that perhaps we were not the purpose of the universe. Lingering self-esteem whispered that if we were not the purpose of the universe, it probably had no purpose at all. The next great step in astronomy was taken by Kepler, who was born in 1571 and died in 1630, who, though his opinions were the same as Galileo's, never came into conflict with the Church. The first two of Kepler's three laws were published in 1609, the third in 1619. The most important of the three, from the point of view of our general picture of the solar system, was the first, which stated that the planets revolve around the sun in ellipses of which the sun occupies one focus. Kepler's laws, unlike the law of gravitation, were purely descriptive. They did not suggest any general cause of the movements of the planets, but gave the simplest formulae by which to sum up the results of observation. Simplicity of description was, so far, the only advantage of the theory that the planets revolved about the sun rather than the earth, and that the apparent diurnal revolution of the heavens was really due to the earth's rotation. 
Galileo, who was born in 1564 and died in 1642, was the most notable scientific figure of his time, both on account of his discoveries and through his conflict with the Inquisition. His father was an impoverished mathematician and did his utmost to turn the boy towards what he hoped would prove more lucrative studies. He successfully prevented Galileo from studying mathematics until, at the age of nineteen, he happened as an eavesdropper to overhear a lecture of geometry. He seized with avidity upon the subject, which had for him all the charm of forbidden fruit. The great merit of Galileo was the combination of experimental mechanical skill with the power of embodying his results in mathematical formulae. Galileo discovered that, apart from the resistance of air, when bodies fall freely, they fall with a uniform acceleration, which, in a vacuum, is the same for all, no matter what their bulk or the material of which they are composed. Throughout the two thousand years, from Aristotle to Galileo, no one had thought of finding out whether the laws of falling bodies are what Aristotle says they are. To test such statements may seem natural to us, but in Galileo's day it required genius. Experiments on falling bodies, though they might vex pedants, could not be condemned by the Inquisition. It was the telescope that led Galileo on to more dangerous ground. Hearing that a Dutchman had invented such an instrument, Galileo reinvented it, and almost immediately discovered many new astronomical facts. The most important of which, for him, was the existence of Jupiter's satellites. They were important as a miniature copy of the solar system, according to the theory of Copernicus. Besides Jupiter's moons, the telescope revealed other things horrifying to theologicians. It showed that Venus has phases like the moon. Copernicus had recognized that his theory demanded this and Galileo's instrument transformed an argument against him into an argument in his favor. The moon was found to have mountains, which for some reason was thought shocking. More dreadful still, the sun had spots. This was considered as tending to show that the Creator's work had blemishes. Teachers in Catholic universities were therefore forbidden to mention sunspots, and in some of them this prohibition endured for centuries. Galileo was ordered by the Pope to appear before the Inquisition, which commanded him to abjure his errors, which he did. He solemnly promised that he would no longer hold the Copernican opinion, or teach it, whether in writing or by word of mouth. It must be remembered that it was only sixteen years since the burning of Giordano Bruno for similar offences. At the insistence of the Pope, all books teaching that the earth moves were therefore placed upon the index, and now, for the first time, the work of Copernicus himself was condemned. Galileo, however, was of an optimistic temperament, and at all times prone to direct his wit against fools.